Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth Share Green Design Masterclass. Share Green Design is a digital ecosystem of exemplary case studies, research, methodologies, and ideas that showcase sustainable architectural design from around the world. Our mission is to substantially reduce the industry carbon footprint by providing architects, engineers, and construction professionals with the knowledge that they need. Masterclass is a space where we invite top experts on very specific topics related to sustainability in the built environment, decarbonization, health and well-being in buildings, and much more. Today, our special guest is Mina Hasman. Mina leads SOM Sustainability and Wellbeing Daily Operations and Long-Term Vision for Achieving Excellence in Practice. She has experience in a wide variety of projects in Europe, UK, Middle East, and Asia, bringing a greater understanding of the implication for sustainable and equitable design in different climatic, social, and regulatory contexts. As a recognized expert in the field, Mina has been elected to and is actively involved in the UK GBC Board of Trustees, RIVA Council and the Practice and Policy Committee, CAA Council and Chair of Practice, LETI Steering Committee, UNEP Global ABC's COP Task Force, CAC Climate Change Committee as the Deputy Chair, World GBC Advancing Net Zero Steering Committee, CBC Intelligent Buildings as Vice Chair, and the ISBI's Health Equity Advisor Group. Mina regularly contributes to the wider climate change, sustainability, and well-being debate in her role as tutor at various academic institutions, as well as regular speaking appearances at many international events. She's also the author of the RIVA Climate Guide, which equips the built environment professionals with key knowledge to mitigate the impacts for climate change. During this masterclass, Mina will provide a detailed overview of the RIVA Climate Guide and how it links to the Global Climate Framework Initiative, which she has been leading over the last three years. Mina will also briefly present six case studies projects that are included within the RIVA Climate Guide. So as usual, we'll have a Q&A session after the presentation. So please post all your comments and questions in the chat on whichever platform you're streaming for. And we'll go through as many as we can. And as a last reminder, we will be recording the session and we'll post it later on our channels for your review. So over to you, Mina. Thank you very much, Beth. And thank you uh, also for the wider Share Your Design team for inviting me to talk to you about my recently published book, The RIB Climate Kind. It's an honor to be here to present the first book in the world that contextualizes the UN Sustainable Development Goals within the built environment landscape and addresses the core competencies with essential knowledge and skills that every built environment professional should be equipped with in order to effectively address the multitude of challenges we face today. But before I can provide you with an overview of the RBA Climate Guide, I would like to briefly introduce myself, then contextualize this material and tell you a little bit about the holistic set of topics of the climate framework, which this book is structured around. I'm an architect and environmental engineer. On my day job, as Beth has mentioned, the sustainability director at the global design practice of Skidmore Owens and Merrill, and also to nurture my passion and scale my impact. In addition to that, currently wearing multiple hats in various industry-wide and academic organizations so that I can help accelerate the collective solutions to the challenges of climate change. As I mentioned before, today I would like to provide you with an overview to the global, uh, global climate framework initiative, um, which this book is structured around, um, uh, and, uh, and really talk about why uh, it has been established and the mission and the vision behind it. This transdisciplinary initiative was established three years ago as an international voluntary effort with the aim to ensure that both direct and indirect impacts of our decisions within the built environment sector are consciously acknowledged and addressed against the UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. Its main mission has been to break down silos in the industry by cross-pollinating experiences and exper ex expertise across the value chain. And doing that across the global built environment community, where we currently have uh, plenty of uh, thousands of members that are collectively aiming to establish a common ground and create a common language around climate change within both industry and academia that I think we so desperately need. The second aim of this initiative is to align expectations 
and create a thread of knowledge weave through from industry to academia and vice versa. This is essential to ensure continuity and consistency in the way knowledge is built, disseminated and built upon throughout different stages of, the, of a built environment actor's life. Under this initiative, we're really bringing together various generations and sharing knowledge as well as experiences while also encouraging a greater unity between the built environment sector and academia with the ultimate goal of upskilling and building our industry's collective capacity for climate action. Because no single individual or no single organization will be able to overcome the challenges we face today. That's why it's essential to nurture this collaborativeness and collectiveness that is desperately needed, I think, in a greater amount than it currently is in the industry and academia. And in this way, we're also able to close uh, feedback loops by bringing the know-hows of practice into the next generation of built environment professionals' core education. And also by leveraging the best academic research when we connect industry and academia together, we're able to inform the progress and help deliver the innovation the construction sector continuously needs. So how does the climate framework structure and taxonomy look like? As mentioned before, the framework contextualizes the UN SDGs within the built environment landscape and focuses on the goals that can be directly impacted by the work we deliver across the sector. This does not mean it actually neglects addressing the other topics. It inherently and indirectly addresses other topics such as zero hunger, um, but or uh, but quality of education. But those are not the uh, goals that we have identified within this initiative that we can directly impact. Whereas affordability of energy or um, in creation of sustainable communities is something that we as built and wired professionals can directly impact with the work that we do. And therefore, the climate framework structure only comprises those topics that we can directly impact and inherently um, also acknowledges the indirect uh, goals that we are um, touching upon uh, with the work that we do. Um, and as mentioned before, um, the, the UN SDGs are at the heart of this initiative and at the heart of the taxonomy and the structure that is created by the climate framework, uh, which, or, which is organized, I would say, o o around sort of perhaps the six main overarching themes as presented here in colors. And these themes, as well as sort of their sub themes or topics, aim to cover all disciplines represented within the built environment sector as much as possible from interior design to architecture to engineering of any kind and urban as well as city planning among others. This is essential so that we don't talk about only from an architect's perspective or from an engineer's perspective, but we try to create this unified and common language that I talked about before. And, um, and the aim is actually really is to address the impact of the built environment professionals work at different scales from individual buildings to cities as well as regions. And the way that the book is structured is exactly like that. It actually starts from looking at the bigger picture, bigger context of, a, of the global context, and then narrows it down to some case studies, both at city scale, even regional scale, as well as um, neighborhood and building scale and interiors throughout the different sections of the book. Um, and, and we also acknowledge the importance of the, and the need of embedding this holistic and transdisciplinary approach into the sector. And therefore, the Climate Framework Initiative took over two years of consultation uh, to inform its set of topics. And in this process, it went through a global consultation where over 750 individuals provided valuable input, which also has led the tremendous support that we have received to this initiative today where there are more than 100 international organizations. But I think most importantly, it's important, um, it's essential to highlight how this initiative has progressed and infiltrated into the industry and how it's making a difference. Through these years, I think um, through our various engagements, the RIBA became the first professional institute in the world to adopt the climate framework structure and informed its climate literacy mandatory competence requirements, which are currently presented in its knowledge schedule that you can see here. And I want to applaud RIBA for doing that because our aim is that climate framework is utilized as the basis of, of any training program, as the basis of any academic curricula to really establish these fundamental topics uh, to ensure that all the built environment professionals of today, but also the students of the future 
the students of today, which are the who are the built environment professionals of the future, can really be equipped with the consistent same level of knowledge. And commissioned by the RIBA Publishing, the RIBA Climate Guide was consequently created to provide guidance on these holistic topics to all built environment professionals around the world, and I would even say to those teaching in academia, as there is this emphasis on bringing the academia and industry together and aligning their expectations. And it's important to note that the book is intended for all professionals whose key decisions impact the built environment and not just for architects and not for those only practicing in the UK. I cannot emphasize this enough. I think often when people see the name RIBA uh, as part of the title, um, they believe it's only for architects um, as it's published by the RIBA Publishing and it's also only for those that are practicing in the UK. But the book is, if you have the opportunity to, to purchase the book and to read through it, you realize that it actually has examples from the UK and from Europe, but also has examples from all around the world. Um, and it's important to do that because at least it was very important for me to do that, is because the climate change um, challenges are faced uh, equally around the world. And if not in a graver concern, in a graver immediacy in other parts around the world than perhaps in the UK. Uh, and therefore, every country, every city, every citizen, I think, needs to play the part and therefore needs to be well equipped, even at a high level, with the level of knowledge that, that, um, that I aim to provide within the book. And as mentioned before, the RBA Climate Guide is also structured around the climate frameworks topics. Um, this uh, six overarching topics that are supported by um, introductory to chapters the first of which is actually maps out the essential uh, background knowledge around global research, policies, commitments, and the projects which relate to climate change. This first chapter called the Global and Built Environment Climate Change Fundamentals. The next chapter of the book uh, takes this broader knowledge and makes it very relevant to the built environment landscape. Um, and this chapter is actually called the Built Environment Context, um, uh, sorry, Sustainable Outcomes and Common Threads. And in the Climate Framework Initiative is actually called the Built Environment Context and Landscape. In the Sustainable Outcomes and Common Threads sap chapter, um, we actually cover uh, a variety of very crucial topics of um, outcome-based design, retrofit, disaster risk resilience, climate justice and procurement, as well as research, life cycle costing and innovation. These topics are referenced throughout the entire book, even though they are um, amplified and highlighted in, in one chapter, um, because we believe that these topics need to be consistently uh, looked at from different perspectives with a focus emphasis and in relation to the main theme they are referenced under. For example, retrofit is looked at from the perspective of energy and carbon, so it's actually referenced back again in the energy and carbon section of the book, but it's also looked at from a from um, how, for example, retrofitting a building uh, will impact people's health and well-being. So it's also referenced again within the human uh, factors chapter of the book, which looks at um, people's side of the equation. And then there is also the impact of the retrofit on water or ecology and biodiversity. And therefore, the topic of retrofit is again brought back uh, with that lens and with that from that perspective in the water and also the ecology and biodiversity chapters of the book. And um, at the heart of the guide are the six overarching themes that are presented in six chapters, um, as I briefly mentioned before, and they provide this high level uh, knowledge around the concepts which we must all consider and embrace. Um, and this is essential to holistically address um, and also mitigate the adverse impacts of climate change in our day-to-day -day work. The first of these uh, chapters is actually called Human Factors, which covers subjects in relation to people and the impact the built environment has on people's well-being, behavior, and lifestyle. This chapter also touches upon topics of social value, community building, and just transition as crucial topics uh, that is related to the people. And, um, and I think it's important to highlight here that when we talk about health and well-being, it's not only the air quality, it's not only about the bringing daylight into the spaces, it's not only bringing sort of vegetation or connecting people to nature, um, which is which are sort of heavily discussed in the fundamentals of biofield design, which the book covers, but it's also 
looking beyond the physical well-being of people, the physical health and well-being of the people. It also looks at the social side. It also looks at the mental side of the equation. And therefore, it was important for me to talk about the social value and the interventions that we create as architects and engineers within the built environment landscape um, and how they affect the society at large. The next chapter of the book is uh, called Circular Economy, and I think the name is probably indicative of what it covers. Um, it's specifically looking at resources that are used, management, maintenance, and procurement in order to encourage circularity at all aspects of a built environment's life. And this is eventually with the ultimate goal of promoting endless recycling and reuse. Um, I cannot iterate this enough. I think circular economy is a concept that has been more heavily discussed in the industry over the last few years than ever before. And I'm actually very thankful for that because it really promotes the system-wide thinking, larger scale thinking, and also interconnectedness and interlinkages that exist of any decision that we may be taking within the built environment that's landscape. And also how those decisions impact almost like in a chain reaction manner or in a domino effect um, other uh, related topics, either directly or indirectly. And I think this circular thinking is also very much um, at the heart of the UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. And that's why even though within the climate framework taxonomy and structure, which is mirrored in the RIBA climate guide structure, we don't talk about the, uh, UN, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals of zero hunger or, um, or quality education in depth as much as we do for affordable energy or um, or water or um, impact on land and so forth. Um, it's essential to know that um, a lot of the decisions that are taken on those goals that we may be directly impacting, they also have an indirect impact to the other uh, goals and other areas of priority um, around the world. Chapter five of the book focuses on energy and carbon, which really brings this net zero energy and carbon among other related subjects to the forefront by providing a clear understanding of what decarbonization means and also by offering guidance on how to minimize energy use and reduce whole life carbon emissions. And in this chapter, there is a great emphasis on um, first and foremost, the priority of renovation, retrofitting, and also using sustainable local materials that are procured sustainably and that are procured and sort of supplied and manufactured ethically. I think the ethical side of the equation is also really important to mention here. And in addition to that, it also emphasizes the importance of looking at uh, any uh, built environment, any product, any material, any building, any structure from a whole life carbon perspective. Because for, for many years in the industry, we have very heavily focused on um, energy reduction. And we looked at operational energy quite, we've been looking at operational energy for decades now. But I think now, because we face such an urgency um, to address the climate emergency, um, that we it's essential for us to look at also the embodied carbon emissions um, in tandem. So therefore, this whole life uh, carbon picture, uh, where we look at operational carbon, operational energy, and embodied carbon emissions is critical and is heavily discussed within this chapter of the book. Um, it's also, the, the section of the book also acknowledges that um, there will be inevitably some emissions, residual emissions that uh, are released from the built environments that we create, especially as it relates to embodied carbon emissions for, let's say, for large scale projects where materials such as concrete needs to be inevitably used today because there's no alternative uh, that is uh, market-wise available and viable that provides the same strength, for example. Um, and therefore, wherever there is materials as such uh, that is utilized, which inevitably emits embodied carbon emissions, um, then uh, there needs to be a careful consideration of on-site or off-site renewables incorporated into the project to really um, reduce uh, the impact the built environment has so that the carbon emissions can be offset. And the book also talks about carbon offset credits and how they need to be providing additionality and come from verifiable sources. Um, and uh, I don't want to dwell on too much on, on these, but um, a lot of those quite complex and um, 
I think uh, perhaps sometimes too technical and too expert level information is also distilled down to something that is manageable, hopefully, that you find and that's easy to navigate through within this chapter of the book. The next chapter, chapter six, is on water, which focuses on water use, harvesting and recycling, as well as climate change's impacts on natural water bodies and water availability. I think it's really important in the industry, we often talk about um, how we can reduce the indoor water use in buildings. But it's also important to talk about how that water is, um, is coming out of our buildings and how we can actually prevent the waste of water coming out of our buildings by recycling that wastewater and filtering it and reusing it on site. Uh, because often a lot of the water that comes out from the buildings um, may not necessarily be treated and filtered before they are discharged into um, water streams, into rivers, into oceans, into seas. And, um, and this creates a, um, a very harmful um, impact onto the natural um, water ecosystems. So this chapter also, again, looking at the very bigger system-wide thinking perspective, it talks about the sort of strategies that design teams can actually like very um, uh, diligently implement in their projects to reduce potable water demand in indoor and outdoor water uses in buildings, but also talks about the impact of the water use in general to the global context um, from a perspective of water scarcity or, uh, or drought or also the impact on the natural water bodies, as I mentioned before. The next chapter of the book is on ecology and biodiversity, which emphasizes the importance of finding a balance between people and the natural environment, as well as the built environment. It looks at focusing on efficient land use, nature-based solutions, and sustainable food production, among others. Again, this is a very, uh, perhaps, a typical and unusual um, of any of the guidance we see out there that has been recently published on um, how to achieve, for example, net biodiversity gain or how to promote or en enhance ecology within a built environment project. This chapter, in addition to talking about all of those, it also looks at sustainable food production and the impact our decisions within the built environment landscape indirectly, uh, again, indirectly uh, makes an impact on the food sourcing and food availability around the world. And so even though we may be talking about um, impact on land, which is one of the goals of the UN SDGs, as a goal that we can directly impact with the work that we do within the built environment sector, um, the, those impacts have a chain reaction and eventually they are indirectly impacting the goal one, which is the zero hunger goal of the UN SDGs. The last uh, chapter of the book emphasizes connectivity and transport. Um, it really addresses the urban scale and, uh, of the built environment, placing importance on um, how people, places and cities and regions connect to one another through active travel and other future sustainable means of transport. There are five sub-chapters sub in each chapter, in each of these sort of uh, six chapters that I talked to you about before. Um, which aim to reflect the breadth and the richness and the depth each overarching team uh, and topic embraces and represents. I thought it was important to sort of divide these overarching topics into sub-chapters sub to be able to give relevant case studies, um, and I will talk about the case studies, but relevant case studies um, in the context of the, sh of the short text that is provided for each of the sub-chapters. And the book is over 280 pages, but I would still say it's a short book because, um, because of the topics that it's trying to cover. It really is the first book that brings all of these topics together. And there's a lot of ground that has been covered by many other industry experts around the globe and academics around the globe over the years. And what I try to do in this book is really to bring back uh, all that knowledge into one single source. Um, if you have purchased the book and if you get a chance to read it, you'll realize that it's heavily referenced. And actually, RBA Publishing said to me once, I don't know if this is still true to date, but said to me once that the, this was the most heavily referenced book uh, that they have published to date. 
Um, and I took that as a compliment because it's important, I think, to acknowledge the work that is done by others. This is such a grandiose topic and it's such a complex topic when we talk about climate change, uh, even when we focus it within the built environment landscape that I, I cannot, uh, I, humbly, I cannot really provide all that knowledge. Uh, I don't hold all of that knowledge and I think it's important to acknowledge the amazing work that is done by others and reference it uh, within the single source that I aim to create. And that's what I, I try to do. So each book, if I can go back and sort of um, walk you through a little bit of the structure of the book, um, each chapter of the book follows the same structure. Um, I'm going to try to see if the, I think my slides for some reason are not advancing. Not sure why. Um, Maybe I'll just escape this uh, for some reason. It just got stuck. Let's see. Okay, now it's, it's advancing. So each chapter of the book follows the same structure, starting first by setting the global context on the importance of the chapter's overarching topic, and then also by uh, providing an um, executive summary to the entire chapter. I would actually say it first talks about, you know, uh, what is the aim of it and why is it important and also what is it? Um, so in this section, um, we the book is actually uh, also supported by uh, this, this full page illustrations that give um, guidance on the specific strategies. And this is not an exhaustive list, but gives guidance on the specific strategies that the design teams uh, Again, any designer, architects, engineers can actually incorporate in relation to this topic to their um, to their work. Um, and I can just say that um, similar to the structure that is followed in each chapter, each sub chapter also of the book is consistently organized. Um, uh, and I briefly mentioned about the multimodal transportation. Um, networks chapter, which has a case study that you can see here. So these case studies actually provide um, a, a, almost like contextualize this very heavily referenced theoretical and research-based knowledge of the book that is provided in the text originally with key information and data that is implemented in real life project. Um, out of the 30 projects, almost all of them are built examples. So, um, and with a sort of post-construction data provided as much as possible. And therefore it makes the context that the book provides in its uh, text format, in a theoretical format, perhaps uh, very real. And all the case studies are also structured in the same way, starting with the uh, context, uh, which provides an overview of the project in terms of its location and the importance of, it, of this build structure um, on its site. And this section is then followed by the facts about the project, uh, which includes the vision behind its design and its specific characteristics that gives this project its unique identity. Um, a, a section uh, provides, uh, there is a section that is followed by this, which provides a further overview on the architectural sort of design practice that this project is designed by and also why this project has been uh, almost like a landmark, has established an exemplar case study for um, other projects around the world um, to sort of look up to uh, when we talk about this particular topic, which is the connectivity and transport, and specifically the low, um, low modal connectivity and transport within the built environment. And, uh, and this section, after the overview, it actually um, looks at key strategies, um, which with the aim to provide sort of guidance to other designers out there again um, on how this project delivers on the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, which is also indicated in the book. Um, and it actually links back to the overall 17 goals that are identified for the prosperity of our and the planet's well-being. I briefly mentioned there are 30 case studies in the book, but over 100 case studies uh, at different scales in varied contexts as well as geographic locations were examined for the book, among which only 30 were selected because these were the only ones that had reliable published information 
Um, and there were so many other beautiful projects um, in addition to the ones that are included in the book that I really want to include. But um, what I noticed that while I was doing the research on these case studies, that there isn't much published data out there. So I guess my, my one uh, call to action for anyone who's listening to me today is to share your information, share your projects, share your data publicly, because a lot of people can learn from these case studies and uh, and they're a valuable in, in uh, resource whether they're in the uk whether they're in europe or anywhere around the world and i cannot emphasize this enough i think often in the industry we look for case studies that are um within our own sort of country maybe within our own city because of regulatory reasons because of the context because of the climate but i would encourage you all to look for also international case studies from time to time because even if they may be located in a different country in a different regulatory context uh, if they have similar climatic conditions and that will be an important factor to be um, to be aligned with uh, if they have similar climatic conditions then it, then there is a lot of the design strategies at least you can take as inspiration um, back to a project in the UK and in this uh, in this book um, uh, I'm not necessarily talking about because there wasn't enough number of pages to do that, but I'll, because there were limitations on the number of pages that I could produce for the book. Uh, but um, so I'm not talking about how the case studies, international case studies can be relevant to the UK context. But um, I think for anyone who's reading them, it's it's very obvious that um, that a lot of the uh, strategies um, that a project incorporates, such as bringing daylight and how to effectively bring daylight into a building is very, very universal around the world. Um, so hopefully they can, even though they're international case studies, uh, among some of the UK ones, the book is still very relevant to the UK audience. And I and I think to sort of iterate the importance of um, having public, uh, public data and published data, um, hopefully there will be more data that can become available in the next few years and and I hope to grow the sort of the diversity of the case studies that are included in the next editions of the book from many parts around the world um, uh, not only in terms of the building scale case studies but also regional case studies and in smaller scale sort of interior design case studies around the world and um, so the case studies currently presented in the RIB Climate Guide showcase examples from built projects across 26 countries in the world with supporting reference information from North Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, and India uh, that is provided throughout the entire book. And I wanted to bring these, um, these regions around the world, these parts around the world to uh, the attention of the audience here is because um, in previous conversations, uh, people were asking, well, there, we don't see any case studies from the Middle East, whereas the greatest amount of construction is currently happening. And it's true, but Middle East, because because the construction, a lot of the construction is happening now, um, I know that Dubai has been built over the last few years, but the, surprisingly, a lot of the, uh, despite that heavy construction that has gone on in Dubai, for example, um, if I can highlight just one part in the Middle East, that has had a lot of construction. Um, surprisingly, there isn't much information and data available publicly on the public domain um, that I could draw from. And therefore, there isn't a project in the Middle East, for example, that is mentioned in this project or, uh, or in India or Central Asia or North Africa. Uh, but there are sort of regional uh, research examples and re regional sort of case studies included throughout the text of the book. Um, and again, these were all brought from the resources um, as references from uh, the work that is done by others. And I think I'm coming to a conclusion to this presentation. Um, I think I want to say thank you to everyone who's listening today. And I hope you will find this book a valuable resource and that can provide you with the necessary guidance you may seek to inform and influence your day-to-day -day work. I will be more than happy to dedicate the next uh, 15, 20 minutes to really help answer any questions you may have. I'm mindful that I have covered probably a lot of ground today. And also I'm mindful that the book covers a lot of ground. Uh, so it can become sometimes overwhelming, but, uh, but I'm here to sort of help answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mina. 
it was a great presentation and if people haven't seen uh, this book before i honestly really recommend it i have read it myself and i think it's a, a great resource it it brings together a, a very holistic and very contemporary view towards how to act from the built environment uh, to tackle climate change as a lot of of the literature around say the the built environment is one of the sectors that contribute more to to climate change so it's a a, a great opportunity for the professionals in the built environment to to tackle the the climate change so it's amazing to see this type of of resources and so accessible so beautifully presented so organized mm -hmm. and clear and amazing illustrations i don't know uh, who made these illustrations but it's it's great everything is very nicely described and it, it's a long book i mean right here it's, <laughs> and I still say it's short because there is so much to cover. But, yeah, but but the images uh, help articulate it, and and it's not long. I mean, it's it's very well described, very accessible to any type of of uh, audience. So congratulations! It's it's an amazing resource that you have created. Thank you, Beth. And I should mention, I think the illustrations really uh, made the book what it is because um, the topic is inevitably uh, sometimes doom and gloom. It's inevitably depressing, you know, um, because that's the reality. Um, but uh, what I wanted to make sure is that there is a there is a hope for anyone who's reading this book and there is a positive um, attitude in the way that the text is written. And hopefully that comes across that way. But also, more importantly, before even getting into the text, I wanted to make sure that people are attracted to this book. Um, because, again, it's such a complex, such a technical sometimes, and uh, such a doom and gloom topic, inevitably. And there's a lot of books out there that talk about the reality of climate change and the negative impacts and, and how, you know, if we don't urgently act, we, we're losing the momentum and we're losing the hope that we have in the future. But I think there is always hope. And, and hopefully the illustrations, as you are alluding to, really um, helps bring that uh, context live and, and, and engages people. I think that's what I wanted to make sure that it engages people in this quite heavy topic sometimes. Yeah, that's great. And also, I mean, it's a topic that it's complex. It's really complex. It's really holistic. It has so many sides of it that having a, a easy to read tool is, is great. And yeah, so, thank you. Thank you so much. So I invite everyone to, to take a look uh, at the book. As you were saying, mentioning before, you will be presenting it. Uh, you will have- Yes, thank you, Beth. Actually, I can include a link. I forgot to mention, but if anyone is based in London and if you are available, um, we will in, we will love you to join us uh, on the 12th of October evening at 6.30 p.m. at the London School of Architecture, which is um, kindly hosting all the RIBA guide authors, including myself, but also other authors that have written the other two guides on health and safety and ethical practice. Um, and we'll, we'll be doing a book launch event for all these three books that have been published over the last years and also do a book signing event too so you can purchase the book at a discounted rate there as well and there'll be nibbles and drinks and a great networking opportunity so i would encourage all of you to join yes I would perhaps I, can, I don't know how i can include the link uh, to the eventbrite page and it's a yes. free event to attend we will share it in, in our social perfect. media perfect uh, you can send it us and then we will share the details uh, in our social media Thank you. So we have a couple of questions. The first one, is the guide government funded and free? So the guide is not government funded. I wish it were. Um, it's not government funded and is not free. It's currently being sold um, at the RIBA bookstore. And also you can purchase it online in various uh, platforms, including Amazon and others. Thank you. Uh, second question. Does the circular economy chapter elaborate on the legal and certification barriers for using materials? 
So it briefly touches upon uh, where we specifically talk about the environmental product declarations and health product declarations, sort of EPDs and HPDs um, and timber and the issue of um, insurance with timber and so forth. But it doesn't, it, it, again, it, it doesn't have enough space to, uh, it didn't have enough, it, I wasn't allowed to have enough space to elaborate on this one in too much depth and detail, but it's great to hear uh, sort of this question and hear some suggestions that you may have, because I'm hoping there will be future editions of the book where they will be giving me more space to sort of dive deeper in some of these higher level topics that I briefly touched upon in the book. Yes, I mean, in, in your book, you go through a very specific size of the topic. Um, but in all of them, there's a lot to yeah. to go deeper on. So for sure. yes, yeah. For, for sure. instance, circular economy. Uh, yeah, what we are struggling in this industry at the moment is to really implement it in a way that that uh, it's real now and that so we can have real benefits, uh, real circular economy, and not just a few. Um, uses of some of the things. So it, it needs a really a deep revolution in the way we, we procure and we certify materials and how we classify them and how waste is converted into a resource. So all of that needs still to be developed. <laughs> exactly. And I think in the book, I think it's also important to emphasize the book is meant, as I mentioned during my presentation, is really meant for anyone and everyone who's, whose decision is impacting the built environment. Um, when I say anyone and everyone, I actually have, I'm thinking of students, I'm also thinking of clients, I'm thinking of like developers, and um, you know, besides the design team that we typically will be much more engaged, I think, with these topics, um, contractors, subcontractors, and it really wants to give a high level knowledge around these topics and not necessarily build expertise. So it's not for experts. I mean, experts will enjoy it too, hopefully, but it's not meant for experts. It's not meant for specialists. It's meant for a general audience so that everyone can have a little bit of a high level understanding. And therefore, um, therefore, even though the book is long, I think it's still short because it's, it's trying to cover all these topics at a very high level. And as you said, Beth, there is definitely a huge, huge space and place to dive much deeper in each of these topics. And I think there'll be a couple of different books that can be created even for one chapter of the book. Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> and there are, there are many things available, but um, not in a collective altogether way. Um, I have another question. Um, where is the best place to find and or submit project data? This is amazing because I'm I'm gonna actually I'm I'm currently I have put together following the um, extensive research I did about nine months of research for case studies it's, it, it's a long time because I really wanted to make sure that I did not neglect any project that was out there that was exemplar that I couldn't bring into this book um, and I had a lot of different discussions with various architecture firms and design firms really to get data. One issue, as I mentioned before, uh, sorry, I'm going to answer the question, but I, I'm giving this context. I think it's important. One issue that I came across that one, uh, the data is not published because the data does not exist most often. So what I discovered is that people often either do uh, so almost like posthumously, like postpart, post, uh, yeah, postmortem analysis of the design once it's completed. Uh, maybe at a high level, uh, just to, you know, for planning purposes or, you know, to fulfill a certification or something like that. But there are never, but one is very few people go back, very few organizations, very few people go back to their build structure to really evaluate how that build structure performs, not how it was predicted at design stage. So there is, there is quite, there. A, bit of, there is quite a bit of design yeah. stage data, um, even though that's not consistent because, for example, and I'll give an example from the UK. Um, if we only look at projects uh, based on what we submit to planning today, uh, based on Partel, then we're not really still seeing the full energy use of our projects because Partel excludes uh, certain energy uses, such as like vertical transportation from its assessment and evaluation of a project's energy use. And therefore, 
even even if there is design stage data that data is not accurate because it's um, uh, sort of piecemealed or sort of it, it excludes certain things because that's how the guidance is provided um and uh and there is, and even if there is design data is not consistent you know so you cannot compare one project to another uh even if they are the same project even if they are side by side in the same city uh site for example um and then let alone i think the biggest issue and what i want to do is that i want to bring actual data not design stage data but actual data but as, as you can see in the book um I struggled even finding that information. So I tried to put as much information as possible, whatever was was shared with me also by the design teams and by the clients, uh, but not uh, unfortunately not all the case studies have the actual data either, even though I still want to um, wanted to get that. So to help answer the question that Debbie has kind of raised is, uh, because of this context, uh, I actually took it upon myself as a mission to really gather as much information as possible for the future editions of the book. And I may actually be doing a separate book just only looking at case studies. Um, and I, I am actually soon to be sharing a survey and it's going to be a public survey. So I'll send the link on Climate Frameworks website. Um, yeah. I can send the link, uh, Beth, if you wouldn't mind sharing with the oh, audience yes, today. Yes. Um, so I, I will be more than thankful if you want to submit any project no, we are more than thankful to be included in the next, yeah. next versions of the RIBA climate guide or, or another book maybe yes please and i have a question so you have been doing this um, research in parallel about case studies and gathering information on case studies from all around the world do you see any like um areas or, or areas or places where uh, there is more data available that we have to learn from or there are like um more case studies to be checked on or how how do you map the information at the moment i think it really i, I don't want to isolate necessarily a certain part of the world even though there is an obvious one if we just look at for example energy and carbon um i don't want to isolate a certain part of the world because as i mentioned before uh, like water scarcity is not a greater issue for us as it is, for example, in Africa or as it is in India today, when I say it for us in the UK. Uh, for example, we focus heavily on retrofit in the UK because in UK and Europe, retrofit is, is like almost uh, the most important topic we need to address. Whereas when you go in Africa, there isn't anything or there isn't much built. So for them, retrofit is not a priority topic for them you know, ecology is a priority topic for them. Uh, new builds, you know, the strategies that one needs to consider for new construction is a priority. It, or if we go to India, like um, water is is a priority theme and topic. Of course, I'm not saying that, you know, in these parts around the world, we would neglect net zero carbon ambitions. We will do net zero carbon, but then there is an added priority of like water. Uh, I, I, I saw an article that someone, I think, criticized the Arabia Climate Guide, not heavily, more heavily focusing on retrofit. There is a retrofit section and there is retrofit mentioned throughout different parts of the, um, of the various chapters of the book. But again, because I did not write the book for the UK or European context only. So I mentioned retrofit as much as I mentioned water scarcity, as much as I mentioned impact on uh, you know water ecosystems or uh, on land, on desert lands, uh, such as we find in Africa or Middle East. Um, so I, that's why I don't want to, I think it depends on where we look at it from the perspective, but if we focus on energy and carbon, probably the uh, northern part of Europe it has the, the greatest amount of published data on actual case studies where there is low energy and low carbon built structures, buildings. Good. And that's the, the main data available probably about carbon. That's correct, and yes. About other things, so that makes sense. And also, yes, every part of the world has different uh, priorities depending on many things, including the historically uh, way they are. Uh, exactly. So how they are in that place, it has some historically conditions, so uh, different approaches. Um, have another question. Um, how many of your 30 case studies meet the RIAI climate change? How many meet operational energy targets and body carbon targets, significant biodiversity net gains and targets? 
this is actually this is a great question and um and i started writing the case studies and i wanted to do this sort of table that showed how many of them met the rb2030 climate challenge targets uh, because i referenced the rb climate challenge uh, on the second chapter of the book where i talk about sustainable outcomes and i realized only like about two or three of them actually that i could actually compared to the RIB 2030 climate change, let alone really understand whether they meet or not. Maybe to help answer the question, there are two in the UK that I can um, specifically recall, the, um, uh, the Goldsmith Street project, um, and the Bloomberg headquarters that actually meet the RIB 2030 climate challenge, not all the targets, but on um, daylighting, for example, on the health and well-being metrics for the Bloomberg headquarters and um, the Goldsmith Street project meets the uh, operational energy and potable water uh, demand targets. And there are some international case studies, such as the Captain Grimm School for Sustainability and Leadership, which is the world's, I think, first uh, uh, net zero energy school, and that meets and exceeds the uh, net zero uh, sort of operation energy targets of the RBA 2030 climate challenge. But for example, that project and similar to many others that I've included in the book, because they were designed a very long time ago, where the industry globally did not talk about embodied carbon, they don't have embodied carbon data. So I think the embodied carbon data is the one that is missing the most. Um, but also, again, operational, even operational energy data is missing, the actual data is missing from the public domain and, and the architects, in some instances, clients didn't have that information when I asked. So uh, only few, I think, to help answer Simon's question. But thank you for that. Yes, and on that side, yesterday was launched the BECD uh, data. Oh, yes, hopefully, so, yeah. Yes, we, we will hopefully have more data available. Exactly, and I also should mention because I um, and I I have sort of more insights because I sit um, within the RIBA awards group and also um, very involved with the UK net zero carbon building standards. And I know that with an RIB awards group over the last few years, we've been pushing really hard to get the data. Data was originally optional for projects that want to submit, uh, that wanted to be submitted for the RIB awards. But now over the last two years, it's been compulsory to submit data, even if it's at design stage, predicted data, so that we can collect data through the projects. And then on the other side, the UK Net Zero Carbon Building Standard, which uh, some of you may be familiar with, that has done um, an extensive survey across the industry, calling out for case studies and for data. And they struggled, and I know that they struggled even collecting enough data for embodied carbon, let alone for operational energy as well. So this is an indication that we all need to be, as I mentioned before, we all need to be sharing our data more and more. Yes. <laughs> so that we can learn from each other. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. Here yeah, another question. If they don't meet the CC, how many of the case studies declare all the 10 target performance metrics? They actually, it's, it varies because again, the case studies that at building scale, there is a lot of, um, um, sort of different parameters that have been identified as key performance indicators, uh, whether it be biodiversity, sort of net net biodiversity gain or potable water reduction um, or, um, you know, specific like overheating risk uh, assessment or an overheating sort of limits in terms of temperatures and so forth. So there are a variety of different um, performance targets that have been identified in building projects, but the book also includes a lot of um, uh, sort of larger scale master plan and sort of landscape, for example, projects and so forth, that uh, this kind of information is not always consistently available for. Yes, and at Share Green Design, we also have struggled with information, not always the information. Uh, so we share projects, uh, as you may know, we try to bring them also with, with some data, and carbon data, it's not always there also sometimes exactly. it is they have it very people don't want to share it and that's a shame because it helps everyone when sharing. exactly and what i realized also when i was sort of researching the case studies and also those within that are included within the book is the case studies that have some sort of a green certification whether it be lead briam or any other 
they usually have more data. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a design stage data often, a predicted data, but they often have more data than other projects that are not pursuing these certifications because the certifications encourages and requires that kind of information to be submitted. So, um, uh, so I don't know. I know that uh, you know I wouldn't I wouldn't be here necessarily wanting to promote uh, the use of green certification systems to declare a project sustainable because I don't think um, a project is necessarily can be called truly sustainable just because it has a certif green certification system. But the green certifications because of the structure and the processes amongst the wider stakeholder group within the project that they put in, then actually it encourages people to collect this kind of data and do assessments um, in projects, which is really helpful. It's still better than nothing, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Also, the, the certifications have been uh, the first steps. So in that sense, they have been very useful and they have been pushing on their side as well. Exactly. And I, I have a, a last question for you. And um, what are the next steps on on this book project or research and all the um, climate climate framework initiative? Is that correct, Daniel? Yeah, it is. Where, where is it going? What are the next steps? So the next steps, I guess, is for for us uh, under the umbrella of the climate framework initiative is to. Um, start a, a series of training sessions around these topics um, with the content that is provided within the RB Climate Guide as well, um, but also bringing experts, subject matter experts, uh, both in industry and academia from all around the world. And uh, Climate Framework is currently partnering with the Commonwealth sort of Association of Architects, Commonwealth Association of sort of Urban Planners and so forth to really look at this uh, these topics from a global perspective. Um, so that's one sign and that's the initiative. We're currently trying to get funding to put together this uh, training program that will have uh, with the aim to have um, accreditation or uh, these acknowledgements by various professional institutes around the world whether it be South Africa um, Institute of Architects, Canada Institute of Architects. I'm giving the example of architects, but um, this will be also engineers and urban planners, uh, the RIBA, SIPSI, and so forth. So we're trying to get this multi-institute, multi-organization accredited training program, uh, which requires funding to, to build because it needs to be built from scratch, but it will be built around the topics listed within the climate framework structure, which are the exact same topics that are included within the RIBA climate guide. On the other side, for the UK at least, or for the RIBA members, I shouldn't say just UK, but for the RIBA members, the RIBA, I'll be working together with the RIBA to put together a training program, perhaps much more UK focused or much more Europe focused. Um, and this will be done within the next year or two um, in parallel while also creating the climate literacy uh, mandatory competence test that RIB is putting together. It's going to be a multiple choice um, exam that is going to be based on the RIB climate guide. And uh, that will also be published towards the end of next year, I believe, by the RIBA. Um, so those two are the both the training sessions. Uh, one is more global audience. One is more perhaps UK Europe focused audience, and then the climate literacy mandatory competence tests are the immediate next steps uh, within the next year or two. But as I mentioned before, I'm hoping that this book will have future editions, and that's not. I'm yeah. not going to decide on that. If the book is sold enough, then it will have future editions, and if it does, then I, my my focus is on getting the case studies, getting more case studies with more actual data, and I would encourage everyone to contribute to that. Yes, that's really exciting. I didn't know about the, all these uh, initiatives that are coming from from that. And are they more mainly focused on professionals or also students? Do you have any kind of approach with universities or? Yeah, so when I talk about, for example, bringing experts uh, to put together the content for training programs, um, that will be a collaboration amongst different professional institutes, um, sort of private organizations like experts and subject matter experts that are working in private practices uh, as well as academics um, so that the content that is created i think the content that is created will inevitably be immediately uh, be targeting practitioners because they are the ones that are this that are making decisions today but they will also be perhaps and maybe this is the way how the 
content can be detailed and that may be split into two different training programs but um, the content should also be relevant to those in academia as well because we want to bring the next generation of built environment professionals and decision makers already on board today so they can be very well equipped yes yes and it's a pity to see that some um architecture um like universities some things are not yet under discussion so yeah it, it's good to engage with architects even before the architects exactly <laughs> and in general with all types of professions right so exactly. yeah that's great um we are almost uh, in our time so we have to to, to stop here but uh, if uh, people have any more questions you can still add them in the linkedin um, chat and mina maybe you can then go through and respond some of those questions that would be great thank you and thank you very much for for this session and it, it has been very enjoyable and it has been great talking to you about thank about you very much. thank you for inviting me it thank was a pleasure you. it was a pleasure to have you here and also thanks everyone for joining um for um coming to this Share Your Green Design Masterclass for the questions. And as usual, this session will be posted online. So uh, our next uh, Masterclass guest will be Anna Mavrojani, who is a professor at the Institute of Environmental Design and Engineering at the Ballet UCL, who will be presenting evidence on current indoor environmental performance of buildings occupied by vulnerable people and discuss the relative effectiveness of potential solutions toward their improvement under the current and future climate. This will take place on the 2nd of November. So check our website, shareyourgreendesign.com and subscribe to our channels to keep up with this and other content we are constantly sharing, such as the latest projects, news, research events, competitions, student work and job adverts. If you have projects or research that you want to share on our platform, please get in touch with us. We even have a student section. And if you have any comments, ideas, or just want to collaborate with us, please get in touch as well. Thanks, everyone, and see you again soon.